Okay, I'd love to begin us. My name is Sean Cordell, and I am the executive director of the Treasuring Christ Together Church Planting Network. And we get the privilege to partner here with BCS to help put on this uh, pre-conference on church planting and revitalization. And so one of the things that I just am so thankful to God for is that we get to be here as learners. I want you to know that God sees um, you and he loves you. And he says he gives grace to the humble. You might not feel very humble, but the fact that you've come here to learn, to glean, he promises to pour out his grace upon you. And so we thank you for being here and giving us just a little bit of your time. Um, Who is Treasuring Christ Together Church Planting Network? We're a theologically like-minded, gospel-formed family of churches. And we partner together for a specific reason, because pastors need strengthening. And so do their wives. Pastoral teams need encouragement. And also, we need one another to fulfill the Great Commission. It is not just something we're meant to do alone. We need each other to plant churches. And so we're just a collective of churches that have a common view of God and a common desire for an aroma of the gospel to come forth from our churches that we would then link arms together to plant more Christ-treasuring churches. So if there is a desire for more partnership, more encouragement, more strengthening, or just tools and tips and encouragement from lessons learned over the years on how to plant and revitalize, we would love to talk with you more. But I want you to know this. When you come to a conference like this, it's very easy to come to glean things that are very practical. And God loves the practical. How do we do corporate worship? What about our community groups? How do we do family life? What does it look like to be an evangelistic church? How do we do missions well? How do we plant churches with great strategy? All of these things are wonderful and good. But the analogy we use is that those are the prongs of a diamond ring. What's the point of a prong? The point of the prong is not to stare at the prongs. Now, we don't want plastic prongs because plastic prongs are holding up something precious and we don't want them to crumble. So we want a healthy church. We want to invest in all of the structures, but we want the diamond to be what is most precious. And that's a little bit behind the logo in which we have Jesus is the treasure. He is the diamond that we love. And if we're all honest, our hearts at any given time, we click one notch off a true north. And we need one another to just say, Jesus is the treasure. So why are you here? Why are we here? It's not first to talk about church planting strategy or really even how much we need strengthening. And we do. We know that by looking to Jesus, that's the foundation upon which our strength comes and our hope comes and all healthy, practical things come. So dear friends, we just want to say with you, we want to say with the psalmist, whom have we in heaven but you? And earth has nothing we desire beside you. No other rivals do we want, but our flesh and our heart, they may fail. Do we get an amen? Our flesh and our heart may fail, but you, O Lord, are the strength of our life. You are our portion, our enough forever. And so our prayer in these talks today is just to hold up the diamond who is Jesus in trusting that that is going to affect every fabric of our lives. So friends, two reasons. We hold up the diamond, and the best package that God has created for magnifying the diamond is his church. And so the greatest cause in all the universe is that the diamond will be heralded through his church. And so that's why we have put on this, is we want more churches to get healthy, that they might plant more churches that are healthy to hold up the diamond who is Jesus. We're going to do that through a few talks today. Uh, Jordan Thomas is going to come up here after I pray, and he's going to speak on the joy of the Father in the church. Then we'll take a brief break. Then Nathan Knight will come up, and he is going to share on the joy of Jesus for the pastor. Then we'll take a brief break, and then we're going to have a and a panel um, with Nathan and Jordan, but also uh, Pastor John Piper and Michael Reeves. And uh, John Erickson will be kind of facilitating that. 
Yeah, I'm the executive director of the Church Planting Network, but John is the director of care in advance for the Church Planting Network. And so you'll see him here in a little bit. And these other two brothers are on the lead team of the Church Planting Network while they also pastor churches. So uh, I want to pray. And after that, Jordan, you'll come up. Now, as we bow our heads... Let's just acknowledge what is a reality. Let's pray. Father, you are here. And every moment of this session, you're going to be with us. And in every session we will hear, you will be with us. When we go back and lay our heads on our pillow, you will be with us. And we just want our hearts to say, you are enough. And so, Father, I plead for the grace in this moment that this would not just be simply something for our heads, but that our minds would be the gateway for you to capture our hearts, that affections for Jesus would increase because we have just continued to stare at the multifacets of your Son. And so, Father, please protect us from making this about our neighbor and making this about our church before we acknowledge that what you want most is our hearts. We are the greatest project in our lives. You love us. And so help us. Help us to be convinced that we need you and we need one another. So right now, settle us, I pray. May your Holy Spirit capture us in this moment. May this be an act of worship. And may amen not be a conclusion of an acknowledgement of your presence, but may all of our listening be us continuing in your presence as you feed us your word through these brothers. Bless them, I pray, and bless this time we ask that we might see Christ and treasure him above all. In Jesus' name, amen. I would have jumped down to up this little stage, but funny story is I uh, broke my nose last Saturday. Doesn't look too bad. Doctor told me I got it straight, hit it on my senior in high school son's forehead, trying to guard him in basketball. Note to self, all you weekend warriors, you can no longer guard your senior in high school son. And uh, then the next day I chipped a bone in my knee doing guess what? basketball with my 18 year old son. Uh, but I'm glad to be here. I didn't know if I was gonna be able to make it a couple doctor's appointments, uh, had me kind of iffy on whether I'd be here, but it really is a joy to be here. Thank you for uh, doing the obligatory session with Nathan and I, so you can get the Q and a with Reeves and Piper. Uh, we know, we know, we know this is like your penance to get the prize, right? So it's all works based. It's meritorious grace, right? Um, so John Erickson came up with the titles of these two talks that I and Nathan will have the joy of bringing, and then a break, and then we'll get that uh, much-anticipated Q&A. But, but the title of the first session that John Erickson gave me is The Joy of the Father in the Church. And I get to glory for just a few moments with you all in a reality that I trust you've heard many times, that is, God is happy but he's also happy with his people. Uh, he, he loves the bride of his son, the joy of the father in the church. So I feel like in a lot of ways, I just won the lottery with John giving me that assignment. And I don't have any doubt whatsoever that many, most, maybe all of you could spontaneously trade places with me extemporaneously and give a lot of good substance to that theme. So with the Apostle Peter, I want to stir you up by way of reminder, and I pray in a way Sean illustrated, if you're one click off True North, that our hearts and minds will be set again on the glory of Christ and the joy of being loved by him. So that's my, that's my assignment, that's my aim, and I do think that I know a little bit about your reality, and that is, uh, like me, maybe some of you, are tempted with this pervasive awareness 
that we think God is moderately displeased with us all the time because we can't get our spiritual act together. And uh, let's just face it, here we are. We're, we're, like this, we're like the select few that pay a little bit of money to go to a conference to learn more how to be a little less displeasing to God all the time. And if he's displeased with us all the time, what must he think about all those pathetic people in our churches who don't listen to all the awesome sermons we've been preaching to them for all these years, right? Is, is, he, is he, in fact, low-grade simmer on displeasure with the people that listened to you all preach yesterday morning? Does he think poorly of them because they can't get their spiritual act together? And, and what about you? What about me? I mainly want to try to show that our joy being the people of God and serving the people of God is really a derivative. It's a secondary benefit of another gladness that God has in himself an exuberantly happy joy in his son. And it's not kind of like that joy that he showers upon us. It's that same joy. And if you'll invite me and if you'll join me, I want to invite you into Hebrews chapter one to see one of the many places we could accentuate this reality that God is really happy with his son. And secondarily, as a direct result, he is very, very happy with that same joy in the bride of his son, the church. Hebrews chapter one, I'm going to start reading in verse one. And I'm reading from the New American Standard, you know, good enough for Peter and Paul, good enough for me too. So uh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Um, Hebrews chapter one, verse one, hear, hear the word of the Lord. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power when he had made purification of sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Verse five, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the son, he says, whom, um, pardon me, verse seven, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Here comes our focus, verse eight and nine. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. It's hard not to keep reading, but would you join me again at the throne of grace as we ask for God's help to consider just a moment that last little phrase, the Father has anointed the Son, quote, with the oil of gladness, beyond or above or more than his companions. Let's ask for help. Father, we come to the throne of grace boldly with confidence. We ask you to help us to see in your son what you see in him and to believe what you say about all who are in him. Lord, would you give us a grace of repentance from disparaging views about the bride that your son has purchased that you will soon, very soon, beautify with an uninhibited enjoyment of all that is ours in him. Give us Christ. Help us to see him. Help us to see your heart. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So there's a couple of little legendary stories that are not true, but uh, it goes kind of like this, and this is kind of true, 
that a number of years ago, I, it, I accidentally memorized the book of Hebrews. And that's the that's the part that's kind of true. It was by accident, and I did memorize it, and you can do it too, and I'll tell you the secret formula. Our church gave me a two-month, eight-week sabbatical, and I read the book of Hebrews out loud every morning, every evening. And the same thing would happen to you that happened to me. Uh, after about two weeks, I was able to finish many of the phrases. If you start a verse, I could finish a verse or tell you the one before it. And after four weeks, you can kind of fill in a paragraph. In six weeks, you almost don't need to open. You're sort of just have little gaps you need to review. And after eight weeks, you got it. And then for the next seven years, uh, I proceeded to try my best to unpack the glories of Christ that I saw in that letter to our two-year-old church. We're an 18-year-old church now. So for seven of our first nine years, we just went through the book of Hebrews and tried to look unto Jesus, chapter 12, fix our eyes on him, look off everything else, look onto Christ. And we just did it phrase by phrase, verse by verse. I sure hope D.A. Carson doesn't study how many exegetical fallacies I made uh, just going deep into little phrases. And today I'm going to just unashamedly pick out one little phrase from the end of verse nine, that is not the main point of the first chapter of Hebrews. Before I do that, let me just orient you to the book briefly. I'll remind you what it's about. It's about J-E-S-U-S uh, from beginning to end. It, it's, it's written to a group of believing Jews, Hebrews. I think they were in Rome based on the last chapter. You get two options, either they were there or they were from there. And I think, as Kent Hughes said, it's one beleaguered little church. It's a local church, just like the one you pastor. They're being tempted to trade on Jesus for lesser things. They're being tempted to like a hybrid half Christianity, Jesus minus, Jesus plus, just so long as it doesn't include chapter 10 persecution and chapter 12, not yet shedding blood, but maybe. I mean, some of their houses got burned down for visiting their friends in prison and their friends were in prison because they loved Jesus. And so on their way home from prison, visiting their imprisoned Christian friend, they see the smoke rising from their house because their property was plundered. And their response was joyfully accepting the plundering of their property because they know they have for themselves a better possession and a lasting one in heaven. So it's written to one little church. We can get that from a lot of places like obey your leaders, imitate their faith. Let us do this and us do that. They knew each other's names, faces. They gathered together and they were commanded not to forsake gathering themselves together. So it's a church. They're struggling. They're being tempted to trade on Christ. So what does the author of Hebrews do for such a congregation? The book of Hebrews is one sermon, chapter 13, verse 25. It's a short sermon. Bear, bear with this brief word, singular, of exhortation, sermon. One sermon that the author thinks is short, takes me about an hour to read it at this pace, conversational pace. I read it out loud twice a day for eight weeks, I told you, it takes me about an hour and five minutes to do it at this pace. And the author said that's a brief sermon, and it shows seven ways that Jesus is better than anything and everything. Chapter one is the angels. Moses, the law, the priesthood, he is the better priest, he's the better sacrifice, so on. So what does the author do? He preaches one sermon, exalting Jesus, densely saturated with the Old Testament, with an unapologetic Christocentric hermeneutic. He, let's just admit it. This brother's pulling passages out of the Old Testament and saying this is about Jesus in a way that we would fail our hermeneutic class for in seminary, right? But he's teaching us what a Christocentric hermeneutic is. And one of those places is Psalm chapter one, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, where he's pulling from Psalm 45, and he's saying this is about him. As he shows the glory and the beauty of Christ, the all-surpassing supremacy of Jesus, that he radiates the glory of God because he exactly represents the nature of God. We should therefore fix our eyes on him. As he shows the all-surpassing beauty of Jesus, the people of Christ are magnetized to him. That, that, that golden chain on the, he's the anchor of our souls in heaven. And he magnetizes us to faithfulness and obedience. So what 
this church in the first century need, needed, when they were tempted to trade on Christ, is a magnificent view of all that is true of Jesus. What might our people need so that they won't trade on Christ? This is the answer. So, it's a little overview. And chapter 1, in my estimation, and I've, I've recounted it multiple times, has, has, I think, 34 unique descriptions of Jesus, just in the first chapter. In verses 1 to 4, there are 10. In verses 5 to 14, there are 24, depending on how you count them. You can just see them in your English translation. You just go through one at a time. There's only 14 verses, and three of the verses don't have any description. So you could say in 11 verses, there's, there's 24 descriptions, 34 descriptions of Christ. And I think in the first four verses, it's, it's the human author describing him. He's the definitive voice of God. He's the superior revelation of God. He's the creator and sustainer of the cosmos. He radiates God's glory. You could keep counting verses one to four, the human author saying he is, he is, he is. But something happens in verse five. It's like God the Father picks the quill up out of the hand of the human author and the Father begins describing the Son. And, and when he does that, it says, verse 5, but uh, to which of the angels did he ever say? And in verse 6, but of the Son, he says that he is the Father. And, and the, the Father is not just taking the quill out of the hand of the human author and giving a divine description of the Son. The Father's doing so through the pages of the Old Testament. So he's grabbing the Old Testament and he's saying, look at him. And so, you know, logos aside, but like a diamond, it's like the Father is, is showing you facets of the glory of Jesus, and then he turns the diamond one notch and lets you see another facet and another and another. And then that's why it took me seven years to get through Hebrews, because how do you skip the fact that he's going to fold up creation like a napkin or a T-shirt? In chapter one, like that gets at least one sermon, right? So uh, our people got bludgeoned with my inability to just skip past little things that are in the passage like that. I don't want to bludgeon you, but I do want to try to show two things to honor John's request for my title. The father's delight in the church, the father's joy in the church. And I mainly want to say that's derivative. That's like a secondary benefit. That is true. It's absolutely true. It's as true that God is happy in the church as it is that he's happy in anything or anyone. That is, that's a fact. And I want to try to show that a little bit or encourage us with that. But I want to say mainly that's, that's a secondary benefit of his delight in his son. And if you're in his son, then he has that same exact delight in you. So let's just try to see it. This is uh, two things. Uh, one, the unparalleled delight of God the Son, and two, the delight of the Father in the bride of the Son. So first, the delight of the Son. Look at this in verses 8 and 9. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Well, hopefully you can see where I'm getting joy, gladness, happiness. That's the end of verse 9. It's telling us that Jesus really is happy. I mean, I don't know if you if you uh, conceive of the Jesus of the Gospels as some kind of melancholy drab who, who, who never smiled, but I, I want to encourage you to re-meditate again, trying to envision the scenarios, I trust you do this already. Try to put yourself in the scene and, you know, there's some subjectivity to that and we probably get it wrong many times. Try to hear inflection in his voice and emphasis in what he's saying. But uh, there's a there's a non-subjective, very objective, you can go just see black ink on white paper in the Gospel of John where Jesus teaches and his disciples ask a question. And it's not interrogation. It's, it's honest inquiry. So, so he says things in chapter, uh, in, in chapter 13 about he's leaving. And, and one of the disciples in 1336 says, where are you going? And, and in 14, five, he says, I'm going somewhere, but, but you can't come now. And so another disciple says, uh, uh, he said, but you can, you'll know the way. And he, and 
the disciple says in John 14, 5, how are we going to know the way? And in 14, 32, another disciple says, well, why are you going to disclose yourself to us only and not to the whole world? So he teaches, they ask a question, he teaches, they ask a question until the pattern breaks. And the pattern breaks. John 15, 11, I've said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. And they don't say, your joy? Like, happy like you're happy? Delighted like you're delighted? Uh, Apparently, they saw a Redeemer who lived, yes, man of sorrows, yes, acquainted with grief, absolutely suffering. But they saw a Savior who had such a restedness in his Father that he took great delight, sorrowful, but always rejoicing delighted in him. And he wants us to share in that joy. So I want to just say from verse nine, the delight of the son. Is is this the Jesus, you know, is this how you and the people of Christ that you serve? Is this how we conceive of our savior anointed with the oil of gladness more than anybody saturated dominated with with joy perfuming from his person this this oil of gladness this 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 aroma of of great delight in the father well first i don't want to miss the forest for the trees so let's just say again this is a quotation from the old testament that's going to be our second point but it's surrounded by a bunch of other old testament citations you get in verse 5 second samuel 7 and psalm 2 And in verse 7, you get Psalm 104. And here you get Psalm 45. And then in verses 10 to 12, you get Psalm 102. In verse 13, you get Psalm 110. Your Bible may just format it that way so you can see quickly that these are, in fact, citations from the Old Testament. And you can also see, as I said a minute ago, I think it's verse 8, but of the Son, he says. So, So these are not just Old Testament citations. They are Christocentric hermeneutics from God the Father in their Old Testament citation. They are about the Messiah. And I'd love to delve into these eight descriptions of Jesus uh, that we only have time for one. So the seven we won't hit in verse eight, that he's enthroned as a king or that one will touch briefly. God is his God. And at the same time, he himself is God. Or, Or you might see in verse eight that he's eternal and rules righteously. His his scepter is righteousness. In in verse nine, his heart bursts with love for everything that pleases the father. He he doesn't just do righteousness. He loves righteousness. And parallel to that passion for all that pleases God is this vehement hatred for anything and everything that displeases God. He, He hates wickedness. He hates lawlessness. Therefore, he's anointed with gladness. Well, let me just touch on two of those briefly. The first is God, your God has anointed you. That's in our verse, but it also says, do you see it? Verse eight, your throne, O God. So put those together. Verse eight, your throne, the father saying to the son, your throne, O God. Verse nine, Therefore, God, your God. So you, you can see clearly, I, I hope you're tracking with me and you could say it better than me, that in verse 8, the Father is saying of the Son, He is God, your throne, O God. And in verse 9, the Father is saying to the Son that the Son's God is God, God the Father. You with me? Okay, so the first thing I want to point out, and this is the reason He's the happiest person in the universe. Jesus is not an idolater. God has no other gods before God. God's the only person who's never broken the greatest commandment. Uh, The greatest sin has to be a breaking of the greatest commandment. Uh, Greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And therefore, the greatest sin must be not doing that. Jesus always loved the Father with his whole being, with all of his soul, all of his strength, all of his might. Jesus is not an idolater, to put it bluntly. You can put verse 8 9 together succinctly, and you could say it better than this, but you can say it this way. God's God is God. 
So one commentary trying to pull out this reality from verses 8 and 9 says the reason that the author cites Psalm 45, verse 7 and 8 in this text is not to introduce a further comparison between the Son and the angels. That's the main point of chapter 1, 5 to 14. But, quote, primarily to demonstrate that addressing the exalted Son as God does not compromise the primacy of the Father, nor does it subordinate the Son. It is appropriate for the Son to address the Father as my God, as it is for the Father to address the Son as God. God's God is God. So can we make any application whatsoever about this in uh, Minneapolis in January? Yes. The good news of the gospel is not God will agree to worship you and me if we'll agree to worship him. He will not make us the center of, of all of his purposes if we'll agree to make him the center of all of ours. It, there's no deal that we make with God in salvation where he joins us in our sinful, myopic self-centeredness. What's the good news of the gospel? Do you really want to be happy? Do you want real joy, something substantial? The good news of the gospel is that God will set you free from all your self-deification. God will, in Christ, invite you to delight with him in what has delighted him from forever. You get to join God in the happiest place in the universe, namely the much-making of God. He sets you free from your myopic self-centeredness. God's God is God. Not you, not me, not our purpose, our plan. Him, and that's the joy that Jesus has only ever known. God's God is God. That's the great point of what you see throughout Hebrews. I'd love to tap on it more, but I'll leave it with you there for now. But because... God's God is God, and because Jesus, the God-man, loves righteousness, what a word, and hates lawlessness, wickedness. First John 3 says sin is lawlessness. He hates sin with the same passion with which he loves all that pleases God, righteousness. Because that's true, you get a therefore. So under our first point, Jesus is very happy. I want to say he's the happiest person in the universe. And, and and we should want to spend time with somebody like that. Verse 6 makes plain that the author is talking about not just Jesus eternal, but Jesus incarnate. It, it says in verse 6, when the Father brings the firstborn into the world. So when Jesus steps out of the portals of eternity, he dismounts heaven's throne, the object of all angelic praise. The angels, Peter says, are absolutely stupefied. They cannot believe that Michael or Gabriel is not coming from heaven to earth to try to redeem our hell-bound race. But Jesus comes. And when he comes, brings the firstborn into the world, for the first time in all of eternity, God the Father turns around to heaven and he says, I want all of you to worship him. The, the locus of the focus of worship moved from heaven to earth when Jesus came into the world. All you angels of God worship him. And then it says, because he worshiped and loved and served God and loved righteousness, hated lawlessness, therefore, what's the consequence? More than all his companions, the Father anointed him with joy. Can you picture this scene? I don't know if you ever seen, have ever seen an anointing. I don't know what images you conjure up in your mind when I say Jesus was anointed. But this is a powerful bi biblical picture. And just turn on your Old Testament Rolodex for a second. Uh, start thinking about some of these passages in Scripture where anointings happened. Now, now we don't, we don't operate like this today, and it's hard for us to conceive all this. I, the closest example that ever happened to me was 7th grade Marion junior high. And um, for some reason or another, I thought trying cologne was going to be a good idea. And I, I haven't seen my dad since I was 10. I wasn't raised in the house with a dad. I didn't know what cologne was, how to use it. All I'd seen was these aftershave commercials where the dude's splashing his face and, you know, it's going everywhere. So, so curve was all the rage. You dudes know what curve is, that old cologne? Okay, so I got a bottle of curve and I 
poured it into the palm of my hand, I'd douse my face. And it didn't matter how many showers I took. I, I wasn't going to smell like I should be at school for a long time. And I go to school and everybody's asking me what I have. It, it's just that little bit. No, no, that's, that's not the picture of this anointing. Can you picture verse 9? I don't know if you've done your Bible reading plan thus far in January and made your way to Exodus 29 and 30, or some of you star students are in Leviticus 8 or 21, or maybe some of you have really been on your game and you're in Numbers 35. Maybe you've got the McShane plan. You're reading from a bunch of places and you came across Psalm 133. Listen to this. Like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robe. Go look at some of those other passages and you'll find out when the, holy, when the high priest was anointed, it would not have been uncommon for the saturation of the ointment to drip off of the tassels of his garment. This man is dominated with an anointing. And this verse says, Jesus was anointed with an oil of joy, an oil of gladness. More than all of his companions, I take it to mean cumulatively. All the people combined. He, he's happier than, than all of them. And not only is he that full of joy, not only is he that saturated with the oil of gladness. Here's my last point. This doesn't put you in the middle. This doesn't idolize you in God's heart. But I want to say un unequivocally, unapologetically, it's because of you. He's not moderately displeased with you all the time. He's not always living with low-grade anger because you can't get your spiritual act together and you didn't have your quiet time this morning on the way to a churchy conference. He's not mad at your people all the time. I'm preaching through judges. I have a category for remedial judgment. Okay, I understand God's displeasure. But in his deepest heart, he bursts with love for you and he's glad about it. How do I get there from this? The quotation is from where? Psalm 45. Guess what Psalm 45 is about? Guess what the occasion is? It's the wedding of the divine king. It's the royal wedding. That's Psalm 45. That's where the king is anointed with joy. My daughter, uh, my oldest daughter is getting married, Lord willing, in August. It'll be the first wedding of my children. We're all excited about that. We're all looking forward to that. Uh, August 10 may mean nothing to you. You may not be looking forward to it, but I assure you in the Thomas household, August 10 is a big day that we're all looking forward to. John Erickson is going to come up in a few moments, has two of his children getting married, uh, Lord willing, this year. I'll have the joy of officiating one of his children, his daughter's wedding in June. His son just got engaged last week, is going to be getting married in August as well, like my daughter. We all know what the anticipation of a wedding will do. All of you who, who are married, you know exactly what that's like. The superscript over Psalm 45 is a song of love. And Derek Kidner said it's an example of, of Old Testament language. This is his description of Psalm 45. And by the way, he can read it backwards in the Greek and in the Hebrew, probably the Greek too. Uh, but he can read it in Hebrew, underwater, hands tied behind his back. And he said, this is an example of Old Testament language bursting at its banks to demand more than human fulfillment. It's like when you read it, don't just skim past it. This is like God pushing the edges of divine vocabulary to tell you he's happy. How does the king view his bride? Psalm 45, 9. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir, O-P-H-I-R. Where is that? Good question. The commentaries and scholars can't quite figure it out. There's four or five guesses of where Ophir is, but what's absolutely certain is the garment of the bride is woven out of the best gold that earth can find. She's beautiful in his sight. He's stunned by how he has beautified her with his love. In verse 11, 
Psalm 45, 11, the king will desire your beauty. He's not sorry that he saved you. He, he wants you. He has no buyer's remorse. He's not trying to get out of the deal. Psalm 45, 13 and 14, the king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is interwoven with gold. She will be led to the king in em embroidered work. Three days ago, Friday, my daughter, who's getting married this summer, uh, did the whole little uh, ceremonial dress shopping thing, make an appointment at the place. You can only take so many people. You get a probably used car salesman type person who follows you around everywhere and tells you why you need the most expensive one. And she got one. All right. She said yes to the dress. And in Psalm 45, it's like the bride is bursting through the doors and the groom is standing at the altar. And yes, he's the object of the ceremony. Let's not flip this on its head. He's the king. It's the royal king's wedding. But he's beaming with delight in his bride. That's Psalm 45. And the therefore, therefore God, your God has anointed you with the oil of joy above your companions. It's tethered, as I alluded to earlier, to the obedience of the king. When the firstborn came into the world, it, it was then that he denounced Satan, bow down to me and serve me. What did, what did Jesus say to him? How God-centered is this? You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Do you hear what Jesus is saying about Jesus? Who, who does Jesus worship during the days of his earth when temptation is assaulting his soul at every part? When the firstborn comes into the world, he's loving righteousness, hating lawlessness, worshiping God alone, unflinching all of life, waking and sleeping, times of pain and pleasure. He's honoring God. And that obedience was anointed with joy. And you're united to him. And you're loved in the beloved. And God has transferred you into the kingdom of the son of his love, his beloved son. I said verses 1 to 4 have 10 descriptions of Jesus and the rest of it has 20-something descriptions of Jesus. And I want you to think about a pronoun, he, H-E, in verses 1 to 4, that's threaded throughout verses 5 to 14, he, 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 he. And in, in verses 1 and 2, you, you see him flinging the galaxies out into existence through whom God made the world. And then you see him radiating the glory of God, the second Corinthians four glory of God in the face of Christ. And then you look deeper into his nature and you find that he exactly repre represents, represents God. He, he possesses the nature of God and, and you find him sustaining everything. Even you right, right here, right now. And, and you keep reading and you find out he made purification for sins. This one, it's meant to cause you like the queen of Sheba for your jaw to drop and your heart to skip a beat when she approached Solomon. It's meant for you to say, oh, behold, the half was not told to me. You, you exceed in, in brilliance and wisdom and splendor and majesty all that I'd ever heard about you. And you see that one living the life you and I were supposed to have lived and then dying the death you and I were supposed to have died and you see that he made, verse 3, purification for our sins. That, that he gave his own righteous, loving, sin-hating, God-worshipping life for us. The, the adequate sacrifice so that we could be beautified with the beauty of Christ. So that we could experience the same love and joy that the Father gives to the Son. And I just wanted to say to you, sweet Brothers and sisters today, God is not moderately displeased with you or your church all the time. In fact, as astonishing as it is, there's not one thing you can do to make him like you more. And doubly astonishing, there's nothing you can do to make him like you less. Yes, he can be roused to pleasure. Keep reading Hebrews. But fundamentally, at its basis, your ultimate standing is something he already sees, that golden chain of Romans 8. He sees you as good as glorified when you're justified. And if you and I could see the people in our pews as they will be 
10 trillion eternities from now, we would be tempted to worship them today because they'll be glorified. They'll be beautified with the beauty of Jesus. And if out of the overflow of that reality, we can serve them now, we'll have more of the heart of the King in us for them. Derek Kidner, one more time. The escorting of the bride led to the king in her finest attire while he awaits her in full state. This is no superfluous formality. It's the acted equivalent of Paul's phrase that Jesus died to present us as a pure bride to one husband, 2 Corinthians 11. And this brings out the emphasis of the first wedding, Genesis, in which God brought the woman to the man and of the last in which the church comes prepared as a bride adorned for her husband to do away with the elements of a mar- of this marriage is to trivialize it, playing down the honor due between bridegroom and bride, the place they both occupy in this wider circle of divine love. So I could give a bunch of applications, but I trust the Holy Spirit will weave into your heart more than I could say. Let me just give them in summary. May we die to the notion under the light of the gospel that God's moderately displeased with our flock all the time. May we pray to be able to see them as they one day will be glorified and serve to that end to help them drink deeply, to sap out of Jesus and to inject into their souls what it means to be satisfied in Christ. May we help them believe that God has no buyer's remorse, that Hebrews 2 is actually happening. He's bringing many sons to glory. Well, how are we going to help them delight in him? Well, the next application is obvious. We have to delight our own souls in the Lord. We have to join Jesus in having no other gods before God, no idolatry, not ministry, nothing. And we have to love being told what to do. Now, I ask my kids all the time, uh, do you like to be told what to do? And and you know the answer. Uh, They don't like to be told what to do. But the Christian question is, do you love to be told what to do? Jesus loves righteousness. He's the true prayer of the psalm. Oh, how I delight in your law. He hates wickedness. Delighting in the Lord, loving his good word. As Nathan's going to tell us in a few moments, that'll overflow in feeding his sheep tending his lambs one day soon. I hope I can be close enough to see you when it's your turn. One day soon, Lord of the universe is going to say, it's time for you to give an account for sister so-and-so and and brother so-and-so. And it's their job to let you do that with joy and not with grief. But my prayer is that when you go back to your people after these days of getting so filled up on God's good word, you won't even remember you were in this room three days from now. My my prayer is the effect that when you go back, more of the aroma of Christ, uh, more of the disposition of the heart of the king toward those precious people, that he loves them and that you're his ambassador to try to convey to them and to show to them, even in your disposition toward them, that they're loved by the king. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, thank you so much for these sweet people and for your precious word. Pray that you would help us, help us, Lord, to believe that we have a relationship with the happiest person in the universe and that we share in that joy and may our joy in Christ flow out in our ministry to his precious people. It's in his name we pray.